So my name is Nils Christian Rosh Nielsen, long and unpronounceable Norwegian name. Um, I'm sorry I cannot speak Italian, but uh, I hope you can bear with me today. So as you said, I'm a field application engineer or a, or a pre-sales engineer with, um, with Digia. I've been working with, uh, with uh, Digia and with Nokia and with uh, Q for the past five and a half years since I graduated from university. And, uh, I wasn't really working with it before then, but I was using it, uh, as I guess a lot of you guys are at the moment. Before that, I was a, I was a user, a developer, playing with it when I was in university, etc. So I have a fairly long history with, with knowing Qt, and uh, I'm very happy now to, to work with it and to be here today to teach you about it so that you can also start working with it. Um, I will talk a little bit today um, about who we are, uh, why Digia, why am I here, uh, and um, I will talk a little bit about what we have done with Qt um, over the last 20 years, but also mainly over the last one year, and um, where we see software development going, what we see as important, and that is very much shaping our roadmap as well. What we are going to do over the next one to five years is, of course, very dependent on what's happening in the software industry and, and what you guys are going to do over the next few years. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we are doing to, to, uh, to target those trends in the market, uh, a little bit about our software offering, our enterprise offering. Um, briefly first about Digia. So, Digia is a Finnish company. It's listed on the Helsinki Stock Exchange. It's um, a, a public company. Uh, we have it says more than 10 years of Qt experience, which is both true but also a little bit inaccurate. We have been working as Digia with Qt for, for more than 10 years. We've had Qt consultants. Uh, we've uh, had people developing Qt applications for more than 10 years. Uh, but Qt has a very long history. and. Um, so th this year is actually a little bit of an anniversary because now in March, in two months from now, it's 20 years since the first company was founded to develop Qt. Uh, it was first a master thesis. It was a, it was a student project by two guys in, in Norway, Eirik Eng and Hovar Nord, and they started, they wanted a cross-platform toolkit and they developed Qt. Um, then in 1994, they founded a company called Quasar Technologies. And Qt is not an abbreviation for that, but they wanted a company name to fill the two letters Qt. They very quickly changed that to Trolltech, which is a company I guess some of you have heard of. And Trolltech was the company that developed Qt for many years. And then uh, in 2008, uh, we were acquired by Nokia, and we were all working uh, in Nokia. So even though Nokia acquired Trolltech, it was the same people continuing to develop Qt. We got more funding, uh, we got to hire more people, we got to do more marketing, so the Qt project and the Qt ecosystem grew quite rapidly um, under Nokia. I think in two years we achieved um, to double, uh, to increase the user ecosystem of Qt 10 times, which is quite significant. And then uh, in 2012, uh, the Qt business was acquired by Digia from Nokia. So now we are the same people, it's the same office, it's the same developers that used to work in Trolltech, that used to work in Nokia, that now work in Digia. So even though Digia as a company only have 10 years of Qt experience, we, the developers who now work there, have a much longer history than that, again, uh, working with Qt. So it's a very strong ecosystem, and it's a very strong history. Um, Digia have um, been working with a lot of different things. We, amongst others, were the ones who taught the other Nokia people that didn't come from Trolltech how to use Qt. So we had a lot of seminars for, for Nokia people back in the days, and uh, we were uh, an important part of um, training and porting uh, Qt onto Symbian, which was the reason why Nokia bought it. We also have, of course, the enterprise version. We are the, the main developers of Qt. Um, in tomorrow's talk, I'll talk a little bit about the, about the project and the ecosystem and who are contributing, but we are the main developers of the Qt project, and we are also the ones controlling the licenses. So all of the licenses of Qt come from us. And um, it says here that five out of the top 10 Fortune 500 companies are 
Qt Enterprise power. They are, they are heavily using Qt Enterprise. Uh, so we have a very large user base of Qt people uh, from the very top of the food chain, from the very largest companies, uh, all the way to uh, small and medium-sized companies and single-man developers and open-source enthusiasts, of course. Um, and there's, there's thousands of, of companies that are our customers. Uh, we have identified, I think, more than 70 different industries that are using Qt quite heavily. So it's not just uh, this application tool for one or one specific industry. It's really used across the board. How many here are actually familiar with Qt from before and know Qt well from before? Raise your hands. Okay, not so many people. Um, so there's a lot of you who don't know much about Qt. Um, and how many of you are, are developers? Okay, we're, we're fairly heavy on the technical side here. Um, so Qt is, of course, um, or maybe not of course if you don't know it that well, but Qt is a C++ cross-platform application and UI development framework. And I think this one sentence defines all of what we are and all of what we do. There's, of course, a number of details. There's thousands of things to talk about, and we are filling here two days with different talks on different topics about cubes. But in essence, that one sentence explains everything that we do. Um, it's all based on C++, and it has been for the last 20 years. Um, and it's not just a UI technology. A lot of people tend to think of Qt as a UI technology. It's something, you, you build an application and you smack a Qt UI on top of it. But that's only half the picture. We have an amazing set of APIs, of classes, uh, to cover all aspects of software development. You can do anything, uh, data management, uh, we have all of the low level classes to do Everything your application needs to do, network connectivity, we have uh, hybrid web development classes with, with WebKit and Web Engine. We have a number of different functionalities uh, in the Qt framework. And I guess many of the talks today and tomorrow will cover special aspects of that, how you can do this thing, how you can do that thing. Um, so what we're delivering uh, and what we are selling is, of course, the libraries, the APIs, so that we can enable you as developers to create the solutions you need. Um, we are shipping a number of integrated tools, a number of, um, of build tools, etc., to make that development easier. And we've bundled everything together into our cross-platform IDE, what we call Cube Creator. That is our development environment that we're very proud of, that we've been developing over the last few years. and. Um, <coughs> that we have now released in, in, in uh, Qt 3.0, no, Qt Creator 3.0, which is the latest and, and greatest version of Qt Creator to date. Um, just want to give a brief glimpse of, of where we are and, and who are using Qt today, because this is a very versatile picture. We have a number of interesting customers in very different industries, from mobile phones to highly embedded products, such here you can see, there's uh, desktop applications, uh, home uh, entertainment, cinema projectors, and there's a coffee machine that we had at one of the events that we were going to, where the where the logic and the UI of the big uh, industrial coffee machine is all controlled by a cute application. So that's a cute cup of coffee. And uh, I mean, there's Nokia phones here that were powered by Qt, and you can see BlackBerry. There's a number of uh, companies that are working with Qt in different industries. And with all of this, vers like, this versatile product, with all of these different users, with, with so many different industries, you'd think that people have very specialized needs and they need to do something and they need a very specialized tool. So how can one tool, how can Qt target all of their needs? I would almost expect, I, I wouldn't expect to see this number. We did a large survey, uh, around 2,000 people uh, answered, so it's a 
statistically significant number. Uh, it's actually saying something real about the ecosystem of cubes. It was uh, Quadriga Consulting, an independent uh, company who did this. It's about half uh, enterprise users and half open source users that have responded. I think this number in particular is 1,862 uh, respondents. There were five categories. 95% of developers using cubes said that they were either satisfied or extremely satisfied with cube overall. I don't think I've seen a number like this in any other industry, in any other tool. And this is, to me, very, very impressive. And sort of, this is what makes it fun to do what we do and makes it fun to deliver what we, what we sell uh, when people actually perceive it this well. So even though we're serving a lot of different industries and even though we have very different customers, they are all very happy. And I'll try to talk a little bit today about what it is with Cube that makes that happen. So looking at the last year, um, what has been happening? And when I say the last year, I actually mean the last 13, 14 months because that's a much more interesting view than just the last 12. So over the last year, we have grown more than we ever have in terms of technology. Um, at developer days, one and a half years ago, we still had Q4 as the latest, Q4.8, that was the latest version of Q that was out. Uh, it was a stable improvement technology. We had just started to introduce QML as a concept. Um, QML is our, one of our UI technologies. Um, but at that point, we, we had not released Q5 yet. Uh, during developer days, uh, one and a half years ago, we, we launched the, the beta of Q5. Uh, it was a long awaited, it was a very delayed project. Uh, there had been a lot of stuff going on with Nokia and internal projects. But from there, I think things really started to just work. So we very quickly before Christmas in December uh, a year ago, we released Q5.0 which really was a big change for us. We have introduced a completely new architecture, uh, the Cube Platform Abstraction, uh, QPA. It was a project called Lighthouse, for those of you who, who followed the development blogs and, and were on the very bleeding edge of what was going on, allowed us to deal with uh, platform integration, integration with, with operating systems in a completely different way. Um, at this point, we were owned and had been owned by Nokia for a while. So obviously, Nokia had a very strong idea about Qt needed to be on the mobile phones. And we had wanted to, to have Qt on mobile phones for a very long time. In fact, we even released our own phone back in the days, uh, the Qt Green phone, for those of you who remember that, which is very similar to what Android has become. It was a Linux stack with Qt on top of it and a great developer experience. Um, but we didn't have the marketing power that Google had, so the green phone never took off. But we, we've always had that ambition. Nokia, of course, wanted to have Qt on the Nokia phones, so Android and iOS was out of the question at the time. But coming over the last year, uh, becoming a part of Digia and opening that whole ecosystem to us, having Qt platform abstraction as a way to target new platforms in an efficient way, we were very quickly able to release Qt 5.1 where we first introduced Android and iOS support, which was something new to us, something that we haven't wanted for a long time. Um, in Q5.1, that was still in, in, um, in beta. So that, was, that was the technology preview of those platforms. We learned a lot. And um, now, before Christmas, in mid-December, uh, one month ago, we released Q5.2, which is the latest version that I would say by far the best version of Q ever, uh, where we had introduced full proper support for both Android and iOS, uh, which I think is a huge step forward for us and something that we, we, cannot, we could only have dreamed of two years ago, I think. So that was, that was a very big addition. And as you can see, we've had, all of these are independent releases of, of Qt versions and products uh, that we've done over the last year. And it's, it's an impressive amount of things that we've been able uh, to, to release. Along with Qt 5.2, we also have uh, Cube for Windows Phone or the Cube WinRT port uh, as a technology preview. So that will also, that's something that I'll talk a little bit about that later 
more on the roadmap side, but that's something that will also be added as a stable, uh, fully supported platform uh, very quickly. We've had a number of Cube Creator releases. Cube Creator um, is a product that's fairly new in the Cube family. We, we didn't use to ship our own development environment. We have Visual Studio plugins, we have Eclipse integration, but people have been using Emacs and Vim and whatever they wanted to for a long time. But uh, now we've seen, we've introduced our own uh, development environment and based it, of course, on Cube. So it's a cross platform application. It's a very good example of what a Cube application should be like if you want to have a cross platform application. Um, and with Cube Creator 3.0, we've also been able to release a stable plugin API, which I will come back to why that is very important uh, a little bit in the end. And Qt Installer Framework, allowing you to create cross-platform installers for your application, making it easy for your end users also to install them to maintain and update their applications, which is very important. So we've always had sort of these two strong footholds in the desktop and the embedded market. Uh, and in the embedded market, we've also grown tremendously lately. Uh, the real-time operating system has been a very important part of our strategy. But with Q5.2, we can fully say that we've now added the third pillar uh, to the Q foundation, which is the mobile industry. And, and we really have, with Android and iOS, along with a number of other operating systems, as I'll show you later, we have now three very solid pillars uh, underneath the Q framework. In 2013, we've also introduced uh, a number of new technologies. Um, and I think everything we do, all of the technologies, all of the APIs that we develop, all of the innovation that we do, to a very large degree, follows three main ideas. It's the uh, embedded development. We want to boost the efficiency, the, the speed to which you can target embedded hardware. We want to enable people to very quickly do embedded development. Um, and Q Enterprise Embedded is uh, our technical uh, way of solving that. That is what we're introducing to solve this challenge. We really want to enable people to make awesome UIs, outstanding UIs, best in class UIs. Uh, if you want to create the, the winning UI application, Qt should be your choice. And, and how can we enable people to, to use Qt in that way? Um, Qt Quick, Qt Quick Controls, um, our new scene graph renderer. Um, these are all technologies that we've introduced to, to really make that Qt UI development uh, extremely efficient. Uh, V4, um, which is um, the, the JavaScript engine that we're using to render QML, um, we were basing it on, on Google's V8 previously, uh, but with 5.2, we have completely implemented our own uh, JavaScript engine, V4. It's, it's completely done by us. It passing all of the 11,500 ECMAScript tests, so it's a fully compliant JavaScript engine. And because QuickQuick uh, is such a different use case uh, from JavaScript in a web page, I know this is a little bit technical, and uh, I, since most of you are developers, but a lot of you don't know Qt that well, um, bear with me. But it really enables us to create super fast, super fluid, and, and nicely animated Qt Quick UIs. And it also allows us to target iOS. Google's V8 isn't compliant with the iOS platform, so that was a no-go uh, in technical and licensing terms. And to, to deal with that challenge, we have really gone through the hoops to, to implement our own. And that is, is the final point where we really need to address all of the largest market queues cross-platform. But that's not worth much if you can't really address the largest markets that are out there. To say that there's a lot of cross-platform toolkits out there that support Windows and some obscure platform that not a lot of people are using. And we don't think that's proper cross-platform. We don't see that as being cross-platform enough. We have great support for all of the largest platforms in the market. And I think that's key to be a, val to be a valid tool to, uh, to, to select. 
And we've been everywhere. Uh, Cube Everywhere was for a very long time our slogan because we support fully cross-platform development. But really in 2013, I think we've been everywhere. Uh, I've been to Dev Days in Berlin. Um, Andy, my colleague who is here somewhere, also was uh, at the Cube Developer Days in San Francisco. And we had Cube Developer Days in China this year. And we're looking to have that in Japan as well next year. Um, Cube Developer Days also has kind of an anniversary as uh, this year. As uh, Cube is 20 years, um, the Developer Days that we organized last year was uh, the 10th Developer Days, which is also a milestone in the Qt ecosystem. And we've hosted three Qt Get Started seminars in uh, a number of locations all over North America, Europe, and China. I think we had six or seven uh, different cities in China where we've introduced Qt Get Started seminars for developers and had a lot of new developers learning to develop with Qt. Um, I've hosted a couple here in Europe, uh, but my, my other colleagues have been hosting a lot more. And we're attending a number of different industry-specific conferences, which is also very interesting. So we have these cute specific conferences, and, and, and cute developers come here together and learn more about cute. But every industry-specific conference we go to, we also see a tremendous interest in cute because people go there to learn about something specific. They want to buy cables, or they want to develop forklifts, or something very specific. And they don't always think that they need to have these UIs, but We'll look a little bit about that later as well, but it's becoming more and more relevant to have um, good user experiences, to have good UIs and applications running on devices, on embedded uh, devices, and all kinds of products in the market. So we have a lot of positive attention uh, at all of these specific, industry-specific seminars. So we'll look a little bit about What's going on in the software industry, and where are we headed, and, and what are we doing? And I think the three sort of key points, or the, or the bullet points that sums up what's happening in software industry, software development today, is convergence uh, and, and multi-stream, and that embedded is becoming a lot more important than it used to be. Um, so, what do we mean with convergence? We're, I think we see a very clear trend where, where applications are converging. Um, they are moving from the desktop. I think the desktop is still a very dominant platform in a lot of ways. But applications that used to exist in the desktop are, are meeting, uh, they are moving over to more embedded targets. Uh, we see a number of industries where previously desktop applications or even like a couple of years back, mainframe applications, you had to call back into the head office to report some sales numbers and you had a guy punching in the data in the mainframe and collecting it and you had no idea how you were performing. But today, operators in the field, out on an oil platform in the North Sea, they expect to have rugged devices with well-known UIs and well-proven uh, user interface concepts. Um, ERP systems, people like me or people in the transportation and logistics, out in the field, they expect to have well-known user experiences at their fingertips. What they did in the office, they want to replicate on their, uh, on their rugged device. Um, you have people like DHL and these transportation companies. You, you need customers to sign digitally on a specialized device at their door. Um, and, and all of this data is coming from a number of different devices but collected at the same point. Everything is, is becoming, you have all of these distributed devices that has the same backend. And we're also seeing a lot of applications, they're becoming multi-screen. They're, they're moving to have more than one platform. Um, in the automotive industry, it's no longer just the instrument cluster that's interesting. First of all, we're adding massive UI's uh, center stacks, but then we also wanna connect the data to displays. And you want to bring your own device, you want to bring your phone in, you want to use your phone to heating up the car before, before you go into the garage while they're having breakfast. You want to transfer your playlists from your phone into the, into the car audio system automatically when you sit in there. And you want to have the same user experience across all of these different screens and devices. 
Um, I think entertainment set the boxes. Uh, you need to have an experience where I can sit in the office and open my set the box application, start recording a program uh, because I'm going to be late. So I want to watch it later when I come home. And I want that to be the same user experience, that the same UI running on all these different devices. And how can we do that? Again, the Quadriga uh, Consulting uh, Survey, the Cube Insight Survey, and this is a, an open survey that you can download from Quadriga, Quadriga Consulting's web pages to see. Uh, it's, it's a lot of interesting data in there uh, on how the industry is changing and how people are using Cube today. So it's a very good study. Um, this is done on existing Cube developers, and, and they say that today, 25% of existing Cube developers are what they call committed multi-screen developers. They are, are targeting more than two or three different screen sizes and operating system and device types. <laughs> and over the next two years, that number is going to grow from 25 to 32%. That's the existing user base. That's 35,000 new multi-screen developers. It's a grand total of 160,000 committed multi-screen developers, if we're looking at half a million uh, developers. And that's only the existing user base of Qt. What we've also seen is that Qt has a tremendous growth at the moment. So, so this number is, in real terms, probably a lot higher, counting in that we're gathering a lot of new developers. So that gives a very vibrant ecosystem. And what makes this interesting is, of course, that Qt is native on all these platforms. Um, Qt is native on the desktop platforms, uh, but it's not just that we are natively integrated with those platforms. I was discussing yesterday a little bit with Andy, who's been porting Qt onto iOS. It's also a mind leader, a mind share leader. If you look at the Coco APIs that Mac is pushing out, they're heavily influenced by Qt concepts. Um, now we're natively supporting all the mobile operating systems, but if you look toward the Linux world and, and Qt on Embedded, a couple of years back, X11 was the only de facto standard, the only connecting point between all the Linux distros. What's happening now with Wayland, and Ubuntu is going with Mir, is that the whole ecosystem defragmenting? No, and fragmenting? We have Wayland support, and Ubuntu is actively porting Qt to Mir so that Mir supports Qt. And that makes Qt become the only connection point in the Linux world. So Qt is now the only stable standard that is connecting all of the Linux platforms. But there's another important key to, to uh, Qt and where we need to go. And today we have native integration, we have native development on the desktop, native look and feel on the mobile platforms. So, we, we distinguish a little bit between the device creation and the mobile uh, application <coughs> development because on a mobile phone you have a UI system. iOS has its UI standard and Android has its UI standard. But a medical embedded device, who knows what it should look like. They, you need to create your own UI. You need to have a custom look and feel. Um, but there's, there's a third important issue and that's that's the ecosystem. Uh, building an SDK, a lot of devices aren't worth much unless people are actually creating content for it. A lot of people look at uh, Comcast. They have uh, an R, what they call an RDK. It's a, it's a development environment for creating set-up boxes. They have built their whole developer offering on Qt because it's a known technology. People can easily use Qt to build Comcast <coughs> set-up boxes, but they can also very easily use other Qt applications as third-party applications in there. Your, your, your platform isn't interesting unless it's scaling. And a couple of years back, I mean, nobody would expect you to install apps in your car. But wherever there's screens now, people expect applications, people expect, that it's this, this is the convergence we're talking about, where you expect to find your applications and your data everywhere you go. And the strength of Qt as an open platform, the strength of Qt as uh, an SDK, 
also uh, proves we have ported Qt onto Android and iOS. They have been strong. They have managed to build their own ecosystems. I don't know how many other phone vendors will be able to build that strong ecosystem. Windows is certainly going to push for it. Uh, we have full support, uh, or will, during this year, implement full support for WinRT API and Windows Phone. So that's an ecosystem that you can also target with Qt. But there's a number of other phones coming out. Yola is a Finnish company uh, from former Nokia employees. They know that if they want to have a successful phone in the market, they can't expect developers to, to start learning a new language and start learning a new technology and build apps for the Yola phone. That, that's not feasible. So they have built the entire UI offering on top of Qt so that all Qt applications will run natively there. And, and that's very interesting. It's the same with Ubuntu phone. Uh, just as Ubuntu is moving away from GTK and moving towards Qt on the desktop, they're also basing their uh, phone offering completely on Qt. LG is providing Qt as the API development framework on their web OS. And there's a number of other um, examples in the market, both in the mobile market, but also in embedded markets. Where people are pushing out products with an expectation of third-party applications based on Qt. So if you want to build an ecosystem, you need to have a known technology. And, and Qt is more and more being thought of as a platform and not just uh, a software development kit. I've been reading some studies lately where people are talking about Qt as a platform. I don't know what that means, but, but when you look at what Comcast is doing and what Yola is doing, um, they are using Qt to build the whole stack. Um, and it's not longer just about the hardware. When you want to build great devices, uh, it's, not longer, it's no longer just about having powerful enough hardware or, or nice, nice rounded edge, edges on your, on your metallic case. You need, to have, you need to have UIs because that's where people expect the magic to happen. And there's a number of challenges in creating stunning UIs, even if you buy a powerful ARM processor or an Intel processor, you need to have a number of tools put together. There are so many things, and I see I'm running a little bit short on time, but what we're doing is to introduce Qt Enterprise Embedded to deal with uh, the challenges of hardware and embedded development. And the next talk in this room is going to be my colleague Andy Nichols talking about the Enterprise Embedded offering uh, what we're really doing there and, and how that works. But I'll briefly go through some things um, and look at some of the value adds. We've just introduced this this fall. Qt 5.2 was the first version where we have Qt Enterprise Embedded. And what we're really doing is providing a platform where you don't have to find all of the drivers and all of the different libraries and all of the different things that go together. A lot of you have probably heard about this as boot to Qt, but boot to Qt is only a certain part of the enterprise embedded stack. And what we're doing is we're providing a full download, a uh, full product for you to download, install, develop your application, and simply deploy it to the embedded hardware. Without, it, it includes the, the full Linux distribution, window management, everything you need is in the enterprise embedded package so that you can very easily start developing for, for uh, any kind of hardware. Currently, we have a number of reference hardwares that's available that you can work with. But the whole idea of this stack is, first and foremost, that it's extendable. We have a very good architecture that we can easily port to any of the boards that you want to want to support, either together with you or we can provide you with the tools to do it yourself. Um, and for instance, the scene graph is an important part of making these UIs look good. And as you can probably expect, yes, lower numbers are better here because it's CPU cycles and it's milliseconds. So the new scene graph implementation in 5.2 significantly increases the, the UI responsiveness. Qt Quick is the UI offering that we're offering to, uh, to create and implement these UIs. I expect there to be other talks about Qt Quick development as well. I know uh, Electrolux will be here and talk about some things they have done together with Devler using Qt Quick to provide really nice embedded UIs. But the, one of the main ideas of Qt Quick, it's not just the technology, it's the whole idea of how it's implemented. We want a workflow where designers and developers can work together 
we don't want designers to work in Flash and then some C++ developer almost correctly <coughs> implementing that with a different response time and everything in C++ at a later point. We need a common workflow. I know I have the glasses of the designer. I was hoping one of you would have the hat of that developer, but I can't see that here. But it's really important for us to have one common workflow. With Qt Embedded Enterprise, we've also introduced a number of Qt Cloud services. It's called Engine.io, and um, it's, uh, or Engineo, it's the first, that's the back end as a service. We're providing um, uh, a full cloud service, a back end, with Qt APIs that's very easily integrated with your Qt application. Uh, a common uh, model with uh, Enterprise Embedded. Uh, we're providing, first and foremost, Engine.io, um, which is a very powerful backend, but we're also going to extend this to a number of other uh, services, such as analytics. Uh, and uh, there's a number of, of tools coming up there. So, so cloud is increasingly important, but we have a number of um, ways we want to increase the Qt ecosystem. And it's not just about increasing our revenue with increasing the number of, of Qt developers. We also want to increase the, the opportunities of the Qt developers, how you can capitalize and monetize Qt applications. So about a year and a half ago, we started to talk about open business architecture. And it's something, this is on the roadmap for 2014. That's something we're going to implement now. Um, different ways for you to be able, through our channels, to sell your plugins, your components, uh, create Qt Creator extensions, so that you can sell those along with our product or to our existing customers, so that as our user base grows, the user base of, of your plugins can also grow, and your opportunities can grow. So what we want to do, what we have is today a very strong foundation of Qt developers, these green pasters, um, the green fields of, of Qt development, um, which is spanning from, from one-man shows to large enterprise companies with 400 licenses. Um, but what we want to do is we've identified a number of things into which we want to grow uh, so that we can extend and expand the Qt business. Uh, embedded is, is a clear focus for us. Um, but also Internet of Things, I mean, connected devices. Uh, there are so many possibilities. We want to provide a great application and UI development framework, but you are the ones who have to have all of the ideas of what are the new products that is going to be brought to the market. Um, I think mobile, there are a number of, I think we've seen a number of different opportunities in the mobile space. I mean, mobile application development is, is one thing, but Qt is also being used for the mobile OS development itself. And, and there's both the indie developers making mobile apps, and you have large enterprises making mobile frameworks. You have the, the huge ERP systems, etc. And then more on the, on the indie developer side, I think what we're going to see is that we're spanning the whole variety and, and the end screen applications, connecting everything. Um, I don't only see that as something that smaller companies are doing, but, but all across the board, people want their applications to go onto a number of different devices, and that's where we're going to develop you. It's what we have been doing for the last year, and it's what we're going to be doing for the next five. So, this is a brief introduction to how we're thinking, uh, to what we're doing. Um, all of this, there's a lot more, and I think this two days will we'll really dig into all of those details. Uh, tomorrow I'll have a little bit more technical roadmap presentation for what we're going to implement over the next year. Um, but for now, I hope this was interesting. I hope to see all of you tapping into these potentials, and um, I hope you'll have a very good day here learning more about Qt. So thank you very much. <laughs>
It's, it's easily available. Uh, one of the benefits of Qt is that we have amazing documentation. I learned Java in, in university, and I, I struggled to learn Java. I spent a lot of time. I, I love being able to start programming. I love what I could do with Java, but it was a painful process. And once I started to learn Qt, it was just it opened my world because the, the, the user documentation is so much better. It's so much easier. Uh, I think everything comes in one bundle. Uh, you have all of the contextual documentation when you need it in Qt Creator. And one of the things I really like about Qt is it has such a great ecosystem of, of people. You can ask questions and people will give you nice and polite replies that are helpful. Uh, I read yesterday an article on Slashdot where uh, Linus Torvalds, uh, who probably some of you know who are, uh, and uh, another Intel developer, for the last year they've been implementing a uh, scuba diving application. So, okay, Linus Torvalds is probably not a UI programmer first, first and foremost, but he's, an, he's a very happy scuba diver and they are creating a scuba diver application. And they had a talk where they talked about moving that application from GTK to Qt. And that experience with the ecosystem, they said was so inspiring because they moved from an ecosystem that was full of flame wars and impolite replies to a Qt ecosystem that was really helpful. That was a very inspiring uh, little article for me to, to read. I have always felt that way. I'm happy that more and more people see that learning Qt is not very difficult. You have a lot of helpful people. You have a very good documentation. You have a very well-written API, which probably is the, the most important thing. I've talked to several people learning Qt that didn't bother to look up the API because after a while they just, maybe this is the way I feel the API should be. They wrote what they thought, and it was correct because the API is so well designed that you kind of know what to do. So I would just download it, start using it, see what happens. Question? Okay, so thank you again. Thank you very much.